Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 7.30 to 8.30 a.m. session of the 2021 Open Simulator Community Conference Day 2. In this session, we are pleased to introduce a panel discussion entitled ScenGate, DreamGate, Docker, and Echo Voice R&D. Our two panelists are Lisa Laxton and Frank Ruloff. Lisa is the R&D visionary and CEO of the Open Simulator Community Focused Foundation Infinite Metaverse Alliance. She is also president of Laxton Consulting LLC with experience providing various virtual world technology solutions for education, research, business, and defense clients. Frank is a senior systems engineer at Thales, Netherlands with expertise areas in training and simulation. He is leading the research and innovation activities related to open simulator technology with Intalis Global Company, using multiple open simulator grids focused on user needs. I want to remind everybody to check out our website, conference.opensimulator.org. You can see more on the speaker bios that we have here today and details of upcoming sessions. This session is being live streamed and recorded, so if you have questions or comments during the session, you can tweet at OpenSimCC with the hashtag of OSCC21. And I want to welcome everybody, and let's start our session. I'm going to pass it off to Lisa and Frank. Hello, and thanks for that intro, and to the conference Hello. organizers for giving us time to present. Uh, I know there's been a lot of great up, uh, presented, and it was difficult to get this time. There's a lot of competition, but it's all good. Uh, Frank and I are both happy to be here with all of you, and congratulations on another great annual conference. IMA has a strategic partnership with Talus Group to work on open source projects together, and we very much appreciate contributions from Talus and its interns. Thank you, Frank, for being their champion. Today, we want to share our progress during this panel, and we hope you will stay with us for the next session to celebrate the work of interns on the future viewer. We should have time for questions before that next session. Currently, we have six open source projects that are active, so let's get started. SceneGate is our primary viewer project dedicated for use in open simulator only. It is designed for improved accessibility, usability, security, and onboarding. Based on user needs, spinoff work in this project includes the future viewer SceneGate 2.0, which is in the next session, and what we call DreamGate. It's a custom, DreamGate is a custom Firestorm installation to address use cases not currently addressed by our other viewer projects. Echo Voice is a major development effort designed to deliver a hypergrid voice solution to the community. Helios encompasses server R&D associated with deploying Open Simulator using virtual machine and Docker implementations. I'm a box evolved from this R&D. Celine is a broad project that includes community hypergrid efforts like OpenSim work and radio stream, the 24-7 hypergrid list, the hypergrid DJ radio board, parcel visitor board, and many more. Not counting the actual work by multiple hypergrid community contributors, we've spent around 4,000 hours meeting and collaborating every week for the last five years on many projects. Yes, IMA just had its five-year anniversary. I wish we had more time to celebrate and highlight contributors. The list is long. Thank you for all that you do for each other. Now, EOS is our newest project that involves Open Simulator 09 software R&D implemented using Docker research from Helios and is also related to Imabox. There is actually a method to our madness, but our focus is on the hypergrid community of avatars. Periodically, we conduct user surveys to help us listen to the voice of the community.
We use these results as one way the community's voice influences our development priorities. Analysis of the results from our July 2021 survey revealed some interesting information we would like to share with all of you. So we'll provide a link to the report with full details later. We asked the Hypergrid community 30 questions of interest to creators, merchants, and grid owners. Amazingly, we had 111 responses thanks to everyone who participated. The margin of error was around 9%, which is similar to other Hypergrid surveys. We sought to answer 10 research questions. First, how are users engaged with respect to system and mesh avatars? Pure data implies 83% of users use system avatars for registered and alt accounts. Of the 17% using mesh avatars, slightly more than half of them are using the Bakes on Mesh feature, and animated mesh parts are the least popular. I think that will grow. The takeaway is that viewer appearance tools are widely used. Two, what do users look for or acquire in the existing marketplaces? This chart shows you uh, a wide variety of work and, and it is actually fairly well balanced, but clothing, hair, and accessories are the top three items. Of those, mesh clothing and accessories are the most popular. Even though system avatars are more popular, the clothing is, tends to be mesh. So the takeaway from that, viewer outfit tools are likely widely used. Then what percentage of users create avatars and associated virtual items? So here we're talking about the creation, not the marketing. About 46% create avatar accessories, followed by 39% who create clothing, and 26 to 30% create animations, gestures, and avatar sounds. We can't forget about those key components because that's what provides a certain level of immersion. So the takeaway is that the viewer build and the upload tools are likely widely used. What is the impact of virtual environment settings, immersive features, or accessibility options? Less than 22% of users prefer the new EEP in regions or parcels that they own. Roughly 60% either disallow or change their settings in parcels or regions that they visit. So most users adjust the time of day and listen to music and sound for a more immersive experience. The takeaway is know your audience when you design your world. How you design it may not be how they're experiencing it. Are language translators, mouse look and voice commonly used aspects of the user experience? Nearly a third of users utilize a translator. We are global after all. Slightly less than half use mouse look and most users engage using spatial voice on average two hours a day. So the takeaway there is that voice is a vital component of the user experience. And what percentage of users create content other than avatar related content? Roughly 85% of users create prim content using viewer tools. Close to 56% create scripts implemented using the viewer tools. That takeaway is build and import tools are widely used. What activates or activities around the hyperverse are the most common? The top three are exploring, building, and creating respectively. This may be different than the user experience and other virtual world platforms, including Second Life. So other activities engaged by more than half of users are the music social event, socializing, relaxing, and shopping. Big takeaway, avatars around the Hyperverse are social. This is a really key component to the OpenSim platform. 
Does the average user have accounts on more than one grid? Yes, the average number of accounts is roughly 2.6, but as you can see from the chart, almost half have accounts of five or more. So that's a big deal. The takeaway is that most hypergrid users have more than one virtual home. Now, can we estimate the actual number of unique users from reported data? We extrapolated the data, compared that to the application of average accounts, and it was equivalent. So therefore, we can estimate the total number of unique users uh, is around 16,000. Based on grids reporting relevant data, what is the size of the hyperverse market? That turns out to be around 36,000 hypergrid avatars. So the takeaway there is there are two distinct markets that exist on the hypergrid, so creators and grid owners take note of that. There were several R&D drivers, and thank you, Maria, for uh, the reported data from hypergrid business. I don't make sure that you let, know that Maria actually does really grab a lot of great data, and it's very useful. Thank you. A summary takeaway is that fully featured client viewers are needed despite calls for future limited mobile or browser development. And while we do have this in mind for the development team, current community needs take priority. We're always interested in more help from volunteers for new and existing projects, so get in touch with either of us if you would like to help. Now, we adjusted the roadmap for SceneGate, changing priorities for avatar-focused features and browser updates to meet immediate needs for live streaming and support for events management. We spun off DreamGate early. Now, due to com community need for a voice solution replacement, we launched an Echo Voice funding campaign to help speed up development. So let's review our progress on SceneGate, DreamGate, I'm a Box, and Echo Voice before we listen to the great work the interns have been doing on the future viewer SceneGate 2.0. For SceneGate, we built upon the work of previous effort to start building new versions. Voice and sound bugs in the Linux version have been resolved. However, the build was designed for 18.04 Ubuntu only work in progress to update that for 2004 Ubuntu. Testers had difficulty with the installation of the earlier release, so we will take a package approach with this one. The untested Mac version with third-party library updates was not a simple build once we began CEF updates. Spaces and directory names had to be found and escaped manually along with the new auto build. It now builds on Mac OS Big Sur, even though it was built originally on Catalina, uh, but it does crash on run, so troubleshooting is in progress. A new Windows version with third-party library and CEF updates is planned uh, after the Linux and Mac versions are ready. So while work on SceneGate 2.0 is underway, which is what the next session is about, we will continue work and support on the 1.x generation. We hope to have a public beta soon for all three new versions. Following test and release, we will start adding requested and community features. For those interested in participating in the beta testing, please contact me. I mentioned earlier that we spun off what we call DreamGate. This image here will show you a little bit about what's different. This is a custom installer for the latest version of Firestorm for Open Simulator only. There are a number of reasons we did this, but it's primarily driven by use cases where SceneGate is not a good fit. And we found the popular Firestorm viewer to be quite capable but new users on moderate systems had difficulty. 
So we made some changes to meet the needs of these users and used our EV cert to provide Windows installers that would not be incorrectly flagged as dangerous to install. Testing of DreamGate is nearly complete, so the repos will be updated soon and it will be made available for download. We have been uh, having that tested by some of our customers and their users and the response is very positive. Now, once Beck is able to add the voice patch from the Alchemy and SceneGate code bases to Firestorm, we will make a new version of DreamGate. We mentioned a project before called I'm a Box. We've not released that yet. We completed prior R&D using multiple VMs and proceeded with research running Open Simulator using Docker. Over the past year, extensive R&D has been underway regarding various backend implementations. Part of this work involved finding better ways to test and monitor performance across multiple grids and regions at the same time. This image shows performance of a server with 47 Docker containers across five operational grids running our version of 09 that we call EOS. During the six hour period, real time monitoring you can see on this chart shows the impact of work within one grid where we were making changes to scripts to reduce the script loading. Now, multiple containers are shown on the graphs with different line colors uh, and the names of those regions uh, were blurred out intentionally. Now, grids using this Docker ba base back in proved to be stable and able to support high capacity events for avatars. We intend to use the result of the successful R&D to provide a community version called I'm a Box. This is a high level diagram of what we decided to put in the box. We'll provide instructions for Linux installation and the image in early 2022. I'm a box is platform agnostic in the sense that headless Linux can be run on any operating system. The last major project to review before the interns take the stage is Echo Voice. Evaluation and design was completed in 2020. However, funded projects take priority for the team because we all have bills to pay. Recently, Vivox announced it would discontinue the current V3, V4 voice offering by the end of 2021. Upgrading to V5 or version 5 would require all the viewer teams to modify code to support that, and the community would continue to be at the mercy of Unity, who owns Fibox now. So Seth designed Echo Voice to offer an open source freeware alternative that could bridge multiple voice solutions, including Fibox. This would be the only way to provide a seamless hypergrid experience and choice for all region owners who want to offer voice. Right now, uh, users, when they're jumping from region to region across the hypergrid, um, they may or may not have voice, depending on if those regions are running voice. But imagine what will happen if you've got some grids implementing Jitsi, some grids implementing WebRTC, some grids on version 5, some on High Fidelity, some on Agora, and so on. The, the impact to the users is negative because the users can't seamlessly just have voice as they travel. Now, to accelerate the development of Exo Voice and meet the Unity imposed deadline, it would have to be funded uh, simply because there is a tremendous amount of work to be done. Otherwise, the project will continue, but only when volunteer time is available. Now, this chart shows you the result of our evaluation of multiple voice solutions and our criteria. As noted in the Echo Voice blog history, VCOM's mumble solution is obsolete. Now, Seth did uh, give me a note this morning that the Mumble project, we've been waiting for 1.4 uh, to come out, which has a really suitable API. 
and 1.4 release candidate is out. So 1.4, the actual release is coming soon. So we're very happy about that. Now, considering the alternatives, uh, a ground-up replacement using Mumble is needed, and that is what we call Echo Voice. And given the recent up expected decision by Lennon Labs to move away from Vibox and use high fidelity, we did the math. We evaluated a competitor called Agora also, which is available on Unity platforms like Vibox. Now, this slide defines a typical use case that might be a social grid, an education region, etc. The constant is defined by the parts where we multiply to get the estimated participant minute. This chart shows the result when we use the formula to see what the monthly cost would be for each solution. And there is quite a bit of difference between them. Now, for Linden Labs and others who are revenue earning, large companies, the cost is not bad. They're, they're absorbing that cost because they're earning revenue on other uh, service lines or products. But for the hypergrid, we believe this is not feasible, and here's why. Most grids in the hyperverse are non-revenue earning. That's a given. Close to 40% of virtual world users in 2015 reported earning under 10,000 annually, US dollars. And with the pandemic, incomes may be even lower now. Event donations average around 100 globits or less, which is basically one US dollar. Uh, using high fidelity, an average single weekly event of five users can cost $12.50 a month, or that's the equivalent to 3,125 globits. So it's unlikely that community donations are going to support uh, that level of voice offering on high fidelity. Now, if you use Agora, you get 10,000 free minutes a month, but if you have three of these average events in a month, you've already exceeded that 10,000 minutes. So we therefore conclude a per minute paid voice solution is just not feasible for the hypergrid community at large. So here are the key standouts for Echo Voice. It works with all the supported viewers. It has no viewer development cost. It includes a bridge for regions using Vibox voice solutions so users could have a seamless experience. If we have grids who are going to use other voice solutions, we'll have to evaluate what would be necessary to add them to that bridge. It works on all operating systems. This is something that Vibox does not, version 5, no longer supports Linux at all. Uh, Agora, it's possible to support Linux. We have spoken with them about that. Uh, Echo Voice has spatial voice features. Uh, Free Switch, while it, it, it's a viable solution for, for the short term, uh, it uses a low-end codec uh, with fairly low quality. Uh, the backward support from Vivox that allowed FreeSwitch free to work in OpenSTEM may go away uh, with version 5. We don't know about that. Uh, and FreeSwitch is not facial, and it would take a lot of code to add that feature. The other thing that FreeSwitch does not have is uh, any kind of indicator over the avatar's head. Uh, and that's a problem when you're trying to figure out who's talking, especially if you have accessibility issues. Uh, Echo Voice can be self-hosted uh, for HIPAA and FERPA compliance and other security concerns. And so medical um, environments, advocacy, counseling, school systems that have FERPA um, protection in place they need uh, to have that self-host capability. Vibox and Agora, neither of them can be self-hosted. Uh, it will be open source freeware for the hypergrid community. So 
what have we done so far? I, this is a big question that's been asked of us. We've spent about 2,000 engineering hours uh, in 2019 assessing VCOMS Mumbo. We were unable to uh, update that because of deprecated libraries. Uh, we spent time designing a new solution, testing a prototype uh, in 2020. Uh, all of that was funded by uh, Frank's company and my own. There are, our estimate is 1,310 total build hours left uh, to complete that work. Uh, we will uh, fund 260 of those hours uh, jointly and that means we need funding for 730 hours for the test version and the additional 320 for the release version. Now, all of that is detailed uh, in the blog. Uh, to get things moving, we launched a crowdfunding campaign and set up that project blog. And we had some questions since the launch. Uh, thank you, Hypergrid Business, for publishing an article to help us get the word out. Big question was, why did we use GoFundMe and not something like Kickstarter? Uh, it's because GoFundMe doesn't take a cut. They don't take any money of that. Uh, the funds can be dispersed during ongoing development to keep the developers paid. Uh, and it's not an all or nothing crowdfunding, uh, so we, we don't have to shut it off if we don't reach the goal. So then the next question is, what happens if we don't reach the goal? Uh, well, development continues, but it has a lower priority. And all funded open source code would be available in the open source repository, but the test version timeline uh, would be unknown without that funding. Now, here are some links uh, to help you learn more or help if you can. And if you have technical questions about Echo Voice, I can forward them to the designer of the project who is working on a deadline and couldn't be here today, and that's Seth Nygaard. Frank, did I miss anything we wanted to share about the project before we open for questions? I think your mic is muted, Frank. All right, so let's go ahead and open uh, four questions. We have a little time here. Did anyone have any questions about any of those projects? I know it was a lot of information to absorb, but we had a short time to feed you a lot of uh, information we had to share. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Beth. She said, Lisa, could someone put the links into chat, please? Now, I think we have them on the website under the session, correct? Because you have this. You have your slides up on the for the session, correct? Uh, the slides are up on SlideShare uh, okay. right now, uh, but I'm not sure that's clickable on SlideShare myself. Okay. Well, if you want, you want to put them in the chat for everybody to grab. I'll see what I can do. Um, yeah, they they are in the SlideShare NeoBird. And, you know, I was going to ask Lisa, um, because the whole voice concept for me, um, I, I have tried to use voice since voice was able to be used everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it is amazing to me the by minute charges that people do, right? Right. Like, how do they even make that a viable thing? But um, is there ways that we should go about this to help your cause with echo voice if you will <laughs> yeah well and that's why the uh the bottom link on the slide is to the campaign okay. uh the the blog also has a link to that uh i was just trying to get to my browser so i could bring that up for you
So if you if you hit that link to the blog, uh, you will find uh, also a blog post about the GoFundMe campaign, and that will lead you to the GoFundMe link at the bottom. Uh, we did make a video uh, for the campaign, and the um, comment we had about the video was that it didn't have enough technical information in it. Well, the whole point of the video is to talk about the social impact, uh, the reasons why we're raising funds and the reason why it's so important, because we want to reach uh, funding sources outside of the open sim community uh, and not necessarily just within the community. But as far as technical documents, those, uh, as they are developed and, and the project proceeds, will be on the project blog and uh, certainly more than just the one diagram that we're showing here. Okay. And Frank, are you there? Well, I'm not sure uh, why we lost Frank's voice. Are there any other questions uh, that anybody might have about any of these projects? Here's a question. Um, Vivix offered small users of the service for free. Is there any indication that HiFi would do that too now that they have landed this big contract? With Second Life, any info on how Vivix even did that? Uh, have uh, we have no idea about uh, what Philip uh, Rosedale, who owns High Fidelity, what his intentions are? I did try to contact him uh, about that, uh, but there was uh, no interest. Uh, and you know, it's it's difficult. Uh, I understand. You know, he's in the business of making money. Um, it, with Five Ox, they're in the business of making money too. The difference is Philip's business model is based on the minute and Five Ox business model is based on concurrent users. So with Five Ox, even if you go to version five, you get 5,000 concurrent users for free, just like you did with the older one, but then you have to pay for the next 5,000 users at the next tier level. Now, companies like Linden Labs, that's not a problem. They're, they're making revenue and, and they can afford to offer that voice feature for free to their users. Uh, but in OpenSim, uh, it's unlikely that anybody would hit that 5,000 CCU. Uh, I don't think it happened over the last eight years or so. But the difference here is that Echo Voice does not use uh, Vibox. We will eventually eliminate SL Voice completely. We don't need that. Uh, we don't know uh, whether Linden Labs, who owns SL Voice, is going to allow Vibox to continue to use their SDK for connectivity. Uh, and Echo Voice does not require any of the viewer developers uh, to make any changes uh, because we'll support all of the viewers. And uh, if you go to version five, viewers have to be updated to uh, take care of that. So there's, there's a lot of little things in play, and that's why it made uh, us have uh, a lot of effort in researching all of the different options and trying to establish criteria for selection. Can you hear me? Yay, we have Frank back. Oh, Welcome back, you. Frank. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so sorry. Apparently, I lost uh, audio for the moment, so uh, mm -hmm. I got uh, the advice to uh, get out of Skype and uh, log in again, and now it works, so I don't know what happened. But, uh, right. Did I'm you making... have anything you wanted to uh, share about our progress, Frank, uh, before we head over to the intern? No, not, not, uh, not, not directly, except that... Uh, um, I think that, that one of the, the, the major point is, and, and we discussed that before, is that um, if you do work on basis on voluntarily, uh, which people do and which make amazing things, it's still dependent on their uh, capacity to uh, their capacity to uh, to support this. 
uh, with right. other words, uh, you have so many times, so many hours in a week that you can spend to do something for the open source community. So it's 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 I think very important, and we have the same problem with uh, with COVID and uh, and uh, and other things that uh, yeah, we we if you want to speed up things, you need funding somehow, and that's the right. idea that we had this um, this crowdfunding to uh, to make sure that we maybe could speed up the development and also in the light of uh, developments uh, with VFOX uh, for open uh, VFOX uh, going to a different uh, version and so which would then make for a lot of uh, hypergrid users uh, yeah uh, not uh, not a very nice uh, uh, situation mm -hmm. um, but still we want to support it and uh, do everything we can to uh, do it as quickly as we can um, so yeah um, the only thing I, I, I saw that I think we had a we uh, I saw that had an, an introduction sheet on the previous one, um, an, an, an introduction on the previous one that I wanted to give a short introduction on the future viewer, what right. the interns are going to uh, to tell. Um, uh, yeah, that some slide is up now. Yeah, so uh, some background uh, now that is that uh, that uh, we at Thales uh, have uh, programs for interns. Uh, they can uh, then uh, do and learn on very various uh, uh, trains uh, to work on the job, working in a company as part of their education. And uh, in my case, uh, with uh, the work I'm doing for Virtual Worlds, for years I have uh, interns, uh, some come from the Netherlands, others coming from France, in this case from France. And uh, we started uh, in 2019 20, to look at a, a different way of uh, looking at the viewer. First of all, the current viewers are not situated to, for instance, uh, uh, um, support uh, the headsets, a 3D headset on the right way. And that is because the loop over the, the viewer and the, uh, the, the server makes it impossible to get, the, uh, to get the, the right frequency for the headsets. So we have been thinking of uh, a number of steps and a roadmap to make a new viewer out of the uh, SceneGate viewer. So the first step, and that's also the step uh, where we have been busy with the last uh, two years and continue to, the, the current uh, interns will go to uh, September 2022. Um, we are looking at taking the um, rendering part out of the viewer and replace it by something else as a first, uh, as a first step. Next step would be, can we do different renderers in, in the same viewer so that we also can support 3D headsets if we want to. So that that is the primary focus that we had in 2019 and in 2020, uh, of uh, 2020, 1920, and up to uh, September 22, to create a new viewer uh, with an updated rendering part. And later on, we want to see if we can change rendering parts, and also we can make the viewer more common in the sense of plugins and make it instantiable to the job the viewer is to 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 perform. Uh, with other words, um, have different voice of IP sources, have your menus uh, uh, tailored to what you want to do with with the, the, the viewer inside a certain job, say a training, so that training menus can appear in the viewer, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what, what the total ro the roadmap looks like. But um, for currently, we are working on this first band, where you see the red uh, square around it, which is uh, separating the rendering part from the current viewer, looking at alternatives for new viewers, for new rendering uh, engines, and try to make a first working prototype of it. Yeah, and they have selected uh, Godot, is that correct? Yeah. As, as the initial uh, game engine uh, to replace the Linden Lab rendering. Yeah. Uh, this is line by line work that these interns have been doing. Uh, and in the process, they've also found uh, some code that is in there that's not even needed, it's not used. Uh, and so, in that sense, uh, Syngate 2.0 hopefully will have a, um, a lighter load on the user system yes, uh, because we'll is, remove some of the bloated code. Yes, and it's also not the intention that uh, Syngate will be compatible with Second Life viewers in the future. Correct. It will be compatible with OpenSim. 
uh, to to make it fully efficient and uh, connected to open simulator and not to to try to keep the balance between second life and uh, and open sim it's purely uh, open sim viewer which makes uh, life a lot easier well it, and it also uh, you know adds to the security effort because uh, while we have uh, had an effort where a lot of third-party libraries have been updated uh, that will be coming out in the next first generation of Seengate, um, when the rendering engine uh, is different and we no longer need a lot of the Linden Lab libraries, uh, we won't have to worry about keeping those up to date. Yep, that's true. And... Um yeah, and, and we can then, uh, on this path of, of the roadmap, we can, uh, of course, extend. Uh, we have now a number of, uh, we have now a number of uh, extensions that we, as a, as a development group, would like to have and to make the viewer more uh, common, for more flexible in use. Um, but, uh, of course, in the future, we can add um, things from the community and, and certain uh, uh, um, functionality the viewer uh, would have and supported by the community is also part can be also put on the uh, on the roadmap for the future. Um, that's one of the things that we uh, we would like to uh, do. And and of course, this just as Lisa already said, we need people to help us um, if we want to continue and to create uh, this viewer in a reasonable amount of time. Then uh, we also need people that want to contribute to uh, to it. All right, I do have a question uh, from Art Blue. If this is as I hear now, then you would have a license to make money by offering it as a service to other areas and refinance it this way. I know you set it on open source, so you could charge only on consulting. There, there are, as I assume, many patents in the voice field. Have you taken care of that too? Does well, have, yeah. Okay. Let, let me see if I can answer that question. First off, uh, Echo Voice is not providing voice service. Echo Voice is providing connectivity between Mumble, which is the voice server, right? So when we are talking about things like voice patents and whatever, that's really outside the scope of Echo Voice. That's, that's not what we're doing. We're providing the connectivity for an existing project. Now, Mumble is a long-running project. It has heavy support, has active development. It is heavily used uh, in industry. Uh, so uh, we don't feel like there would be any sort of a problem with that. Uh, so all of the licensing of, of the voice itself actually happens outside of Echo Voice. That's Mumble. And I hope that answers that question. Now, as far as uh, some implication of a license to make money, we do not intend to offer region voice connection like uh, Vibox offers right now. Uh, as part of Echo Voice, if there's a demand for it, uh, we might look at a way that we could you know, do it at a, a no cost kind of thing. Uh, but I, I would imagine there is some cost involved. Uh, for example, if you don't want to self-host a Mumble Murmur mode server of your own uh, and you want to pay, uh, the Mumble developers have you know, information on their website, which is where I pulled the $11.50 a month. That is, is bandwidth license cost. Uh, so for $11.50 a month, you get uh, tw voice for 25 users uh, you know, 24 hours a day for that month. And, and that's way more affordable than High Fidelity or Agora. Uh, if there is someone who wants to offer region connection, uh, they may do that. I, I don't know what their funding uh, options would be. We have not looked at that because our focus is really on getting the software developed for connecting. Does that answer your question, Art? Yes, Mumble is already free for all. It is open sourced uh, and it's already available for anybody to use. For example, if I w didn't have OpenSim in the mix at all and I wanted to have a voice solution uh, to 
talk with other people that visit my region, I could ask them to down, each download a free Mumble client and then tell them the URL that they could connect to the Mumble server and then we could have a conversation that's external to OpenSim. Echo Voice integrates it within OpenSim in the same manner. You see what I mean? Okay, good. Glad that answers that question. There was a there was a, a, a remark in the IM about uh, not knowing of an, an unfamiliar with Godot uh, as a as a gaming engine. Well, Godot is one of the gaming engines that had a very very active support and is gaining terrain and is, has a very large user group. That's one of the reasons, and it is free, uh, totally open source, and that is one of the reasons we we are looking at it. Um, so there is no, because if you use Unreal, for instance, then there are licenses involved as soon as you are going to use it industrial. And uh, uh, our perspective is still that we want to use it in, 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 in between in our company as a communication platform between different and we want to use open software for uh, open source software then and, and Unreal is not completely license free in that case. So that's Correct. one of the reasons why we choose Godot and also it's a very uh, living community as well. So uh, we, we expect that it will um, stay quite long uh, and, and have benefits from it. So that's the reason why we, we looked at Godot. But the interns will probably tell a little bit more about it uh, later on. Right. Now, uh, to answer Nick's question about uh, can we have a mumble conversation and open sem and external together? Absolutely, yes. Uh, if, if the person who has the Mumble client knows the server uh, URL to connect, then they can do that. Now, with the Echo Voice design, if you look at the diagram, I backed up the slides for you. Uh, in the uh, upper right, there is a red shaded box uh, which says Future Auth Server. Uh, authentication is what that's short for. Uh, that's where we would provide connectivity for a uh, mobile client uh, to connect externally. So say someone who can't be in virtual, uh, but they want to participate in the conversation, that would be one way that would happen. The other thing that uh, I'll give a little clarity on the Echo Voice design in this diagram, and you'll see this in our booth as well, uh, you notice the cyan colored lines and the cyan colored region module add-on. Uh, that's existing. That's how Vibox, uh, or I mean VCOM's Mumble solution worked in the past. Uh, we insert in the Echo Voice design the green boxes, which are the server bridge, the client bridge, that would then allow us to have uh, detection and automatic switching between the Vibox and the Mumble client uh, that's running with the viewer. Uh, so when the user jumps around on the hypergrid and they jump from a region running Echo Voice to a region running Vibox, they don't notice anything different. They just connect. So I hope that sort of clarifies a little bit more about that design. Uh, any other questions? Okay, we've got about a minute left. Any last questions here? All right. All right, well, thank you, everyone, and I hope yes. you stick around for us. The interns are going to give us some great updates, uh, and I really want to help celebrate uh, that work. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, all, for listening to us. And, uh, well, I hope to... Uh, to have a nice uh, presentation by the interns uh, in the next uh, half hour. Thank you very much.